Well, hey, this seems to be a thing that God is doing as much as he's calling some folks away in this season of transition. He is also bringing some new folks into our church family. And so uh, if, if you're one of those new people and you're like, who is this person up here talking to me right now? My name is Tim. I get the privilege and honor of being uh, the co-senior pastor of Life Church along with my wife, Sharon. Um, and uh, today we are going to get into the word. I, gotta, I have to confess to you, we've been doing like... 12 weeks through the book of James, and so uh, I, I went to go prepare this week's message, and I thought, it's a blank slate. The, the world is wide open, and uh, so I was excited, and, uh, but I was also a little bit overwhelmed. I thought, I could say anything, and so I went to the Lord, and I asked him, what do you want me to say this week, and I, I have a, I, I'm in a program uh, to earn a doctorate degree, and uh, I'm about, I just started my second year of that program, and in one of our classes, we meet on Zoom every Tuesday with people in the program all over the world or in this cohort, and uh, one of our mentors, one of our, uh, our instructors for this program, he asked an interesting question this week, and it got me thinking, and as I was thinking about this question that he asked, uh, it, it sparked this whole this whole line of thinking, this is something I had never even seen in the word before, even though it's in a story that I had seen many, many times. Uh, so we're going to come back around to that in a minute. Um, but in order to get to that, I want to ask you a different question. Then I'll tell you the question that my mentor asked me on Tuesday. The question I have for you is, have you ever wanted to change the world? I, I don't mean just like, have you ever wished the world was different? Um, Get the spirit of Mike Pence on me this morning. Um, uh, that wasn't a political comment. That just was a, just, just trying to be funny. It turned into a dad joke. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I ask you if you ever wanted to change the world, I, I don't mean like have you ever asked that the world would be different or looked at the world and thought, this place is terrible, uh, or, or crazy, or broken, or has a lot of problems. I just mean, have you ever thought, I think I want to change the world? There's something about human nature that something inside of us wants to be special, wants to be recognized, wants to be the person that develops the breakthrough. You know, we kind of would love to be the one that tweets that tweet that changes everybody's mind, you know, or, or puts the video online that everybody's convinced by our argument, or we write the book that is like the bestseller. We become famous in some way because of a song that we wrote or had something to do with something that made a difference in the world. Like there's something inside of all of us that for whatever it is, in, like in our respective passions and fields, we would, we're kind of just wired to want to be world changers. And that's not a, necessarily a bad thing, but I think you can see how quickly that can lead to like this kind of pride and desire to, to be known and to be recognized. I absolutely grew up wanting to be a world changer. And, and I did it in kind of the same way that Joseph did in the Bible, that he had dreams and ideas and he went around telling everybody about them and it got him into some trouble. Uh, that's, that was me as a young person. If I'm honest, I, I just wanted to change the world and I was absolutely convinced that that's why God put me here was because the world was broken and you're welcome. My name is Tim. I'm here to fix everything. <laughs> It, it, it got me into a lot of trouble and, and caused a lot of problems, and, and I'm glad that God has taught me some things along the way about how I'm not good enough to do any of those things, uh, but today we're going to talk a little bit about this desire, and maybe, maybe how God actually wants us to be world changers, because I think that God gave us that desire. I, I think it leads to some bad things when not, uh, when, when not surrendered and submitted to God and his plan and purposes for our lives. And, and when it doesn't function inside his kingdom, it's horrible. And, and we make it all about us. But I think God actually gave us a desire to be world changers. I think we all have this deep desire for somebody to know what the impact is that we left on the world. So I want to tell you a story today about some people whose names you don't know, who maybe you've read their story and, like me, you completely overlooked them. But in order to do that, and in order to get to the question that my mentor asked me, uh, and, and to get, and by the way, we'll get back to the passage that Kevin and Kayla read to us a few minutes ago, I want to read another story. 
And I'll read this just briefly, but in Mark chapter 9, and then we're actually going to skip a chapter ahead as well. In Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 33, it says that they, that's Jesus and his disciples, came to Capernaum. When he was in the house where they were going, he asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the way? Just so you can feel good about your life, being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean you never get into an argument again. Okay? Maybe that helps you feel good about your drive to church this morning. I, In verse 34, it says, but they were silent because on the way, I love this, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. (laughs) Nothing has changed. Verse 35, it says, sitting down. So Jesus, he finds out his disciples, he knew. He, he, He finds out that his disciples are having this argument about who was the greatest. And his response was to sit down. Side note, what a baller move. When the one who is the greatest says, what are you arguing about? And it was about who is the greatest, and he's totally the greatest. And his move isn't to do a diatribe on his greatness. It was to sit down. Different sermon, but greatness doesn't need to show off. Okay, so he sits down, he calls the 12, and he said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. One chapter later, his disciples still haven't learned this lesson because, you know, they're like all of us. And it says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus saying, now in a different gospel, it actually says, I love this, it totally throws them under the bus. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew writes it that it was James and John's mom who asked this question right? Mark is a little bit more gracious and puts the weight on them. Uh, But in Matthew's gospel, it's like these guys didn't even have the courage to ask this question themselves. Their mommy had to do it for them. (laughs) But here's the question that was posed to Jesus. Teacher, we want, we want you to do, we want to do whatever you ask. What do you want for me to do for you? He said, they answered him, allow us to sit at your right hand and at your left hand in glory. The guts that you have to have to ask that. Anyway, verse 38, Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We're able, they told him. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup and you will be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. He was referring to the reality that he was going to have his, he was going to surrender his life and that these men would both also be martyred and follow in the footsteps of Jesus in a physical sense. But here's how he responds to their actual question. He says, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those uh, whom it has been prepared. When the 10 disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John because, you know, community of friends, and they were trying to exalt themselves among the rest of the disciples. And Jesus calls all of them over, and he said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus' disciples are talking just like you and I are talking about this desire that we have to be known and to be great and to do something that changes the world. They're ordinary people. and They want to do something extraordinary. But Jesus says that uh, he, he doesn't, what he doesn't do is he doesn't give them, you know, the, the five steps to an influential life. He doesn't give them three quick ways to make a difference in the world. What he says is that the real blessing comes to those who first see themselves as servants of everyone else. That the blessed life is the servant's life. And I recognize that this is a very countercultural teaching. But I would argue to you that this is exactly the teaching that we need in 2020. 
As we're coming down the tail end of a very difficult year where all of us understandably wish that we could just be comfortable or wish that we could be the person who had the answer to all of the brokenness in the world. Because there's a lot of that. And it's an election year, so it's getting, you know, highlighted. And there's been, you know, COVID-19, so all of our stressors and all of that has made even more of our brokenness just highlighted. It's been a difficult year, and of course, we would want to be the people who would have the fix to that. Jesus says the the true blessing comes to those who serve. Not to those who find comfort, but to those who serve. So now, let's get back to that passage that Kevin and Kayla introduced for us a few minutes ago. This is a story that I've preached from before. I've used it to talk about Jesus' power to change water into wine. Uh, I've even preached this in recent years as a Mother's Day message, looking at Mary and her role in this incredible story. But today, I want to preach this message in light of that question that I mentioned, that my mentor asked me. And here was the question. He said, have you ever looked at the story of the wedding at Cana when Jesus turns water into wine? Have you ever looked at that story through the eyes of the servants? And I have to be honest with you, when I, read that, when I, when I heard him ask that question, I thought of that story real quickly. And there was a brief moment in my mind that, I, that it, just for the briefest moment, I went, what servants? Oh, that's right. There were servants in that story. And I wonder if that's maybe how we would think about this story, that maybe we don't even realize the people that have a lot to teach us. And maybe they've gone unnoticed and unseen, but I think in the middle of this miracle moment, we could actually learn a lot from the perspective of these servants. So to put this in its context, let me read to you this story in its entirety. We'll go all the way to verse 11. So we'll start right back up where Kevin and Kayla started for us. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding that took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there for context. Uh, It seems as if she had some kind of a role in orchestrating this event uh, because of the way that she uh, played the, the because of the role that she ended up playing a little bit later in the story. So maybe they were related to this family. Uh, I, I don't know if maybe Mary had like a side gig as a wedding coordinator or something like that, besides, you know, her being the mom of the son of God job. Uh, but anyway, she was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding as well. So maybe this was like a guy who like interned with Jesus for a hot minute, and then he was getting married, something. I don't, I don't know. We, we don't exactly know. It doesn't say whose wedding it was, but there was some kind of a relational connection with Jesus and his entire family and the family that was getting married. It says, when the the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him they don't have any wine. Let's put that in its cultural context. Weddings were designed in this culture to last for days. Like a good wedding would go for a full week, and it was a party. And they had, they had wine, like, flowing freely all the time. They didn't have kind of the, the cultural hang-up that we have here about that. And I'm not making a commentary on whether or not that hang-up is good or bad, but just to say that there they didn't have it. And that, uh, that the idea was that you were throwing a great party if the wine kept going. And, in fact, as soon as the wine ran out, the party would come to an end. So you would, you would demonstrate your wealth and, and what a good party you, you can have and how blessed you are and how, even how honorable you are as a family if you can provide just tons and tons of alcohol. Now, don't take that to be a spiritual permission for you, all right? But you can understand the subtext and the cultural point was that when Mary comes to Jesus and says the wine ran out, she's not just reporting the news. She's saying, we've got a problem. This is a big deal. In fact, it was such a big deal that if everybody found out that the wine had run out, this party would end prematurely. And because of the honor-shame culture that these people lived in, there would be shame put upon the family of the groom who were responsible for providing the alcohol for this party. Jesus' response was, why should I care? That's not exactly what he said, but he said, he said, what does that have to do with you and me, woman? For context, he wasn't saying woman. 
uh, in the Jewish culture, that was actually a sign of honor, and he was publicly, like, he was honoring her in the way that he spoke. So that was a, it was a, he was being a respectful son in that context, okay? I know it reads as if he's like, what does it have to do with me, woman? It doesn't read, it doesn't actually read like that in the, in the Jewish culture. Okay, so he's being respectful, but he's saying, why is that my problem, Right? And then uh, Jesus, he says, my hour has not yet come, meaning it's not my time for public ministry to begin. Uh, Anyway, there's a lot in all of that. Not the sermon I'm trying to preach today. Uh, In verse 5, it says, do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Which is, I mean, for all of the insane, amazing, like, power play moments of Jesus in his life where he's like, hey, remember how I'm God? Um, the fact that she sa- that that she hears him say, "What does that have to do with me?" and he turns like he, he doesn't even get an answer. She turns away from him and now looks at the servants. Doesn't even respond to Jesus. I mean, what a G <laughs> to ignore Jesus. I don't recommend it. And then she says to the servants. Do whatever he tells you. We'll pick it up in verse 6, and it says, Now six stones of, uh, now stick, six stone water jars, that's a tongue twister, had been sitting there for Jewish purification. Each contained 12 or 30 gallons. There's a ton in this message I'm not going to touch on uh, right now as far as the meaning of all of this. We're just looking at the focus of the servants. Jesus says to the servants, Fill the jars with water so They did. They filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. He was the one who was kind of like, he was like the MC, the master of ceremonies, if you will, uh, for the event. They took it to the head waiter. When the head waiter tasted the water after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants knew where it came from. And he called the groom and told him, Everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then, after people are drunk, then they set out the inferior wine. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Again, there's a ton of meaning in this one moment. Uh, But then in verse 11, the story wraps up. It says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. This miracle actually marks the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. We get three rapid-fire years of public ministry after that before Jesus surrenders his life on the cross. He dies and on the third day raises from the dead, conquering death in the grave, setting a new covenant up where he's atoned for our sins and the world is completely changed. Like Jesus, the ultimate world changer, this is the moment that begins his public ministry. But look at this Miracle moment through the eyes of these servants. In the time that I have left with you today, I want to share with you three lessons that we can learn from these servants in a message that that, that I'm just going to call today the real MVP. All right? The first lesson that we learn from these servants is I believe that from this passage we can learn that servants teach us to cover. Servants teach us to cover. Now, let's remember the cultural moment. If everybody finds out that the wine has run out, we're all going home. The party is over. And not only just are we all going home early, but shame will be put upon this family. Not a good situation to be in, right? So that's the cultural moment. It's not just kind of bad. It's going to be super, like, irreconcilably embarrassing for this family. Somehow, remember, we don't quite know why Mary was the person to find out about this, but it kind of implies that there was some sort of a role in the wedding planning that happened or the the party coordination that happened. But Mary somehow becomes aware of the problem in a way that implies that no one else but the servants knows about this problem at this point. And she, she, again, is most likely related to the couple or, or something like that. And then that is how Jesus finds out. Because Mary finds out, she is the one that tells 
Jesus. Again, think about this from the servant's perspective. They know that their job is to make their boss look good. And so as soon as they saw this problem, they went into action to make sure that they could do whatever was in their power to cover for their boss. To cover for the shortcoming. I, I mean, what, what isn't deniable in this is that the, the groom and the groom's family, that for whatever reason, they didn't have enough. Like, there was a definite shortcoming. And what we don't see in the servants is like a side conversation where they go, can you believe Brian? I mean, like this guy never prepares. What a joker. Can't believe we have to work for this dude. Just ridiculous. You know, Mary doesn't come to Jesus and go, the servants are about to revolt. She comes to Jesus and says, the wine has run out. There's nothing in the narrative about the servants that says that they did anything other than take action to help in their power to do what they could to bring a resolution to the, to, to the problem. Could you imagine if one of those servants just walked out, you know, clinks a goblet and just says, ladies and gentlemen, the wedding's over. Wine's run out. It's terribly embarrassing. It's Brian's fault. Uh, you know, see you at the next one. Have a good night. Make sure you give Brian a good scowl on the way out. They didn't do that at all. There's something subtle in the reality that they just went to work. The simple act of quietly telling Mary was a function of their role as servants. It's just the way, like they knew, okay, as servants, our job is not to tell everybody, but to go and see if we can fix this, right? Can we send someone on a Costco run, right? Who's got the Costco card? Let's go talk to Mary, right? They were trying to cover for the family so that the family wouldn't be embarrassed. Let's make this relevant. We live in a world that trains us. Like, we are trained at this point to look for people's shortcomings so that we can compare ourselves to them and feel better about our lives in comparison to theirs, right? If you're a public figure, we are looking for your shortcomings so we can practice what's called tall poppy syndrome, where if you get better than us, we're going to cut you right down because we don't feel good about ourselves if something, someone is higher in status than us. We live in a world that, that encourages us to see failure and uncover it. And these servants model for us what it looks like to work behind the scenes to help someone be covered and maybe to find a solution. They saw it as an opportunity to cover rather than an opportunity to embarrass, right? What if, what if when we see the shortcomings of other people, we began to look through the eyes of a servant? Like when you see somebody fail or, or have a brokenness in their life, and just for the record, you've got them and everyone else around you does too. Right? I mean, like, the people you're sitting around, the people that you're watching this online with right now, every single one of us, I'm not trying to say you're a failure, but you sure have failed. Like, probably today. In some way, that's just part of our human nature is that we're not perfect. But what if when we saw the imperfections of other people, we looked at them and said, oh, here's an opportunity for me to think like a servant. How can I serve this person with love? Love covers a multitude of sins. What would it look like for me to love this person? To, to begin to work behind the scenes and be even be sneaky if I need to about how can I love this person so they don't get embarrassed. But maybe there's a, there's a reconciliation here. Maybe there's a fix here that, that if, we just, if we just talk about their brokenness, We'll never get to the solution, but maybe, maybe we can work behind the scenes to see how we can bless and cover and love this person. Look, we cannot help whether or not we see other people's shortcomings. You can't help it. And it's not necessarily bad that you see them. The question is, will you cover them? And cover doesn't mean pretend they didn't happen. 
Cover doesn't mean we don't have honest conversations. If someone hurt somebody or did something terrible, we need to talk about it. There's consequence, consequences for actions. I'm not saying we pretend like, like abusers don't abuse. Don't misunderstand the context of what I'm saying. We have to have reconciling conversations. I'm talking about a time where you see somebody in an embarrassing moment, love goes and says, how can I help you? Rather than saying, ha, I knew it. Right? So we learn that love covers from these servants. Servants also, number two, teach us how to enlist help. I love this. I love that what they teach us is how to enlist help, maybe even in two ways. They enlisted help of Mary, someone in their immediate context and community who maybe had the resources and the connections that they needed to find a resolution and a reconciliation to cover the host or the groom, right? But they also demonstrate for us the practice of prayer because through Mary, the issue was brought to Jesus, now, I understand that that sentence sounded very Catholic, and let me just clean that up for a second. Uh, we're not bringing our issues to Jesus through Mary. That's not what I'm trying to say. We have direct access to God the Father through our relationship in Jesus Christ by the anointing and filling of the Holy Spirit. We have the indwelling of God with us. We don't need an intermediary human being like Mary to stand in between us and Jesus and answer our prayers or deliver them. Like, we don't need a spiritual UPS guy to deliver our prayers to Jesus. The point is the twofold functioning of problem solving that these, that these servants modeled for us is how do you enlist help? You get your problem in the context of community that is related to Jesus. Who do I know that's related to Jesus? Oh, Mary, who do you know that's related to Jesus? Look around you. When you have a problem, bring it into the context of people who are related to Jesus. And then bathe that problem in prayer. And by, by bathe that problem in prayer, I, I mean bring it to God and then listen. I, I know that's a word that sounds foreign to you. It means you stop talking and you, and you keep not talking until God responds. <laughs> Right? Fellas, it, it means you stop talking, right? Husbands, it's good marriage counseling, right? And you don't come up with what you're going to say next. You literally just wait. Sometimes the preacher is preaching to himself. <laughs> so we bring, we bring our issues into the context of church partnerships or communities of people that are related to Jesus, Right? The early church modeled this really, really well. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 45, it says, Now all the believers were together, and they held all things in common. They sold their possessions and their property, and they distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, this is a very Eastern worldview, where they saw resources as very limited. And so because resources were very limited, the Eastern worldview was... We share everything as we have need. And if you have something, you have a moral and social obligation that if you see a need, you meet a need. That's a very Eastern worldview. I think it might also be a very biblical worldview, by the way. In our Western worldview, we actually have, uh, we have, we have an idea that resources are unlimited, right? And, and, and because resources are unlimited, we see people with needs and we go, well, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I worked hard to get what I have. So therefore, you could just work hard. And that's your problem is you just don't work hard enough. Right? So if you just work hard, like I worked hard so that I could have what I have, then you could also have what I have. See, we have a, an unlimited resource worldview and, and not a servant worldview. See, I think even in our Western worldview where we are very blessed people, and if you're sitting in this place or watching on, like if you can afford Wi-Fi, there's a chance you're among like the top 5% richest people on planet Earth right now, just statistically speaking. We're very blessed people. So it's important that we learn the lesson of the servants that even in the middle of our blessed life, resource-wise, that we believe and understand that it is our responsibility to take what we have and to give it to serve others, right? 
The early church modeled this really well. It was kind of easier for them because of their Eastern worldview. I think our challenge is to push through our worldview that says we're so blessed, why can't you just get blessed? And say, I'm so blessed, let me help you be blessed as well. I think that's the kingdom mentality. And then prayer is talked about all throughout Scripture. I mean, we just talked about this multiple times in our series through the book of James, but let's look at Philippians chapter 4. It says, don't worry about anything. Let's read those words again. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. These servants teach us to enlist the help of the right people and God himself in bringing our issues into the community of people who are related to Jesus and in practicing prayer. I would also argue that they modeled a great deal of wisdom and humility, and and, and we can learn from that. Godly servants, as we see the world through servants' eyes, we would learn that servants don't try to fix everything themselves. Servants uh, Servants don't tell everyone what they think should have happened. Right? There's no verse in here that Jesus goes, hey, hey, servants, would you stop talking about how Brian should have made, bought more wine? It's really unhelpful. You're getting in the way of the moment. They just, were, they just were waiting for instruction. Servants don't force their own opinions. By the way, if, if you didn't just hear a really good three-point sermon on how to pray, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> Servants don't try to fix everything themselves. Servants don't tell everyone what they think should have happened, and servants don't force their own opinions. Here's what servants do. They invite, they involve the issue, uh, the issue with the right people. Or they bring the issue to the right people who will help them then bring the issue to God. And then servants wait on the Lord. Servants of God wait on God. So if if we look through the eyes of the servant, then maybe we would become humble enough to know that there are issues that are beyond our ability. There's something about our our culture that teaches us, like, look, just just be, be strong enough. Be tough enough. You can push through anything. And there's something about the kingdom of heaven and that culture that says, be weak enough and humble enough and wise enough to know that you really actually need Jesus. True wisdom says, I need help. Right? The third lesson that I would say that we learn from these servants is that servants teach us how to obey. Do you want to just take a listen again to what Jesus tells the servants to do? I mean, put, put yourself in the eyes, in the position of a servant. You've come to Mary and said, Mary, we've run out of wine. You're expecting someone to make that Costco run. And Mary turns to her son, and you're observing this conversation. Hey, Mom, what does that have to do with me? It's not the right time. I don't know what that means. I'm just a servant. Mom looks at you and says, do whatever this guy says. I don't know who that is. I'm just a servant. This guy looks at you and says, you see those six jars over there that are used for a completely different purpose? In fact, they're for a religious purpose, for purifying people, and they're, they've got water in them. Like, just, just make sure that they're filled to the brim with water. All six of them, yeah, just go fill all six of them with water. This is going to sound like a, complete, like a completely different conversation, Right? Hey, Jesus, um, I, need, I need some money right now. Could you hook me up with some money? And God goes, yeah, just be patient. Just learn patience. Jesus, that's not what I asked you for. Hey, Jesus, we really need wine. Okay, good. Go desecrate these purification jars. By filling them up with water, we're going to turn it into booze. It's a party. Let's have fun. And, and you know what's beautiful about the servants? There's no verse that, that says, but, or, 
I don't think my boss is going to be really happy with us if we do that. None, none of it. They just go and do it. Right? He says to them, fill the jars with water. Now, draw some out and take it to the head waiter. Three very important words. And they did. I mean, we could just go home on that point. When Jesus says something, do it. Just servants teach us what true obedience looks like. Can I just tell you a rule of obedience? Is there is not a prerequisite called understanding. You know, like how to get into Spanish 2, you had to pass Spanish 1. To get to obedience, you don't have to pass understanding. Remember that God said, my ways are higher than yours. My thoughts go far beyond your thoughts. This is Jesus. We come to him with our problem, and he says something that doesn't make sense. And we're supposed to just go and do it. That's what true obedience says. What if we practice the discipline of obedience before we try to put in the work for understanding? Man, one of the things that gets in the way of us actually behaving like Christians is all of the time we spend trying to understand what we think God meant. Just go do what he actually said. Like, just go confess that sin. Just go forgive that person. Just go reconcile that relationship. Just go stop doing the thing you're doing that's ruining your life and getting in the way of your relationship with God. Just do it. But how could it work? If God, if I forgive, there's still going to be that jamoke that broke my heart. And it's going to just, God didn't say what they would do. He told you what you should do. Jamoke is a word that I'm working into my (laughs) daily. It's a good word. Could you imagine feeling what you would feel as you take water from the water basin and you pour it into the purification, knowing, okay, we started this conversation about about wine. We we were talking about how this wedding is about to end and everything's going to go bad for Brian. For the record, I don't know if the groom's name was Brian. It probably wasn't. It's culturally incongruous name. (laughs) Could you imagine? I don't know how many scoops of water it took. Could you imagine? Six 20 to 30 gallon jars filled to the brim with water. And then then Jesus says, okay, good. Now that you've done that, scoop some of it out. Bring it to the guy that you really don't want to have find out that there's no more wine. Some of the water from the purification base. So just bring that over, you know, to the master of ceremonies. The guy that you know, as soon as he finds out, you're in trouble and the party's over and Brian's going to be super embarrassed. So they scoop some out. This is how my brain works, by the way. I asked my 13-year-old daughter, Hannah, this question this morning. I said, Hannah, when did this miracle happen? Was it as they were pouring, it automatically turned into wine? Or was it, was it still water in the water basins? And then they scooped some out. I don't know, maybe like in a goblet. And then as they, as they were obedient and brought it, did it turn into wine? Like, were they watching and going like, hey, Joe, do you see? this? like, it's getting darker. <laughs> and as, as they brought it, did it turn? Was it still water when they handed it to the master of ceremonies and then, and then it turned into wine when it touched his lips? I don't know. None of that is relevant. I think it's just really interesting to talk about. What's relevant <laughs> is obedience. Because we don't need to understand when the miracle happens or why it happened or how it happened as much as we just need to understand that obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better than understanding. It's better than knowing what's going on. 
I really want to know, when did the water turn into wine? It's really interesting. I can't watch, wait to watch the movie of this in heaven. <laughs> how, did you, how did you do it? When did you do it? But none of it matters. What matters is that these servants just obeyed. Okay, if you're like me, not only do you want to know the thing about when did it happen, but you're probably also in the back of your head, maybe even subconsciously thinking, this isn't a very good point, Tim, because these guys didn't have a choice. It's in their title. They were servants. They literally didn't have the option but to serve. To which I would say, oh, I know. No, that's exactly the point. What if... What if we stopped looking at our relationship with God as a list of options for how to obey him? Or how to bless him, or how to get our name known as a good Christian on my block. Now, what, if, what if I came to Jesus with the same attitude that these servants had, with, with no options but to do whatever they were told? What if, what if you willingly laid down your will. And you said, Jesus, I don't need to understand this, but whatever you tell me, I will do. And then you just do it. I think there's something powerful in that, and I would argue that that might be one of the greatest miracles you would ever experience is a human being willingly laying down their will and partnering with God. I think it's exactly the point when we look through the eyes of the servants, that we would become like them, that they teach us to obey, not because they chose to obey, but because they were in a position where obedience wasn't a choice, and we should learn the same lesson. All right, as we try to wrap this up, I just want you to remember, we don't know these people's names. Look, we don't even know how many of them there were. Right? I mean, I could, I could like deduce a little bit that there were probably several of them. It probably wasn't just like two guys. It was probably a group of servants. It, it, it literally doesn't say how many, but, but I would think that they would probably want to get the fill in the jars of water job done relatively quickly. There were six jars of water, 20 to 30 gallons. You would think that might take a little bit of time unless there was a large group of them. You would think this is like a whole group of servants, maybe like a church of servants, a household of servants, a life group of servants, a friend group of servants. They weren't named. We literally know nothing about these people. We don't know the ratio of men to women. We don't know how old they were. We don't know anything about what happens to them afterwards. We have no record of these people at all. They are given no recognition in the moment. And to add insult to injury that these people were not named in the living word of God, when they handed the cup to the, to the master of ceremonies, you know what he did? He called the groom over and went, wow, good job putting out the good wine. It says he had no idea what happened with the, with the wine. How did we get the good wine? It says in the subtext, oh, but the servants knew what really happened. But they didn't speak up about it. They just let themselves go unrecognized. And they just seemed to be okay with that because their worldview as servants was we don't need the recognition. We got to be a part of a moment. We knew what really happened. And this, my friends, is the ultimate reward and why this message is worth preaching. Not because it's good for a pastor to stand up in front of a church of people on campus and online and say, hey, be servants so that we can get you to sign up for some church initiative, but so that you can see the glory of God revealed in your life. This is the reward for going low, the reward for being unknown, the reward for being a servant, the reward for being obedient. You do not need your name recorded in the history books. You need to experience the glory of 
of God like a servant. And you need, I mean, you need to be a part of God revealing his glory through your life in the world. And you don't get it by being famous. You get it by being a servant. My role is to go low. My role is to cover. My role is to love. I'm not looking for recognition for my efforts. I'm looking for revelation of God's glory through my life. Not because of what I've done, but because of who he is. And I just got to be there. What would it look like in your life if you began to see your moment, your day, your life, Every opportunity, every time you face a challenge, as a chance not to be known as a problem solver, but to be known as a servant, to cover people, to love them, to find ways to bring this issue into the community of God and to pray and expect God to do a good work, to go low, to just obey, not to wait for understanding, but to just do whatever God says. And to watch God's glory be revealed. I mean, do you realize the moment that these guys were a part of? The very first moment Jesus allowed his glory to be revealed. It kick-started his public ministry that led to the cross, that led to the resurrection, that led to you being able to sit here and receive the love of Jesus so that we could be in eternal relationship with a saving and loving God. We don't need to know their names, but I'm so glad that they took some water, put it in some purification jars, and handed it to a chef. What insignificant thing. What boring story of waking up and being obedient have you been overlooking? What unknown person do you see in the mirror every single day and say, surely God could do nothing great with this person? Nothing good could come out of the Antelope Valley. <laughs> And in our pride of self-deprecation, where have we overlooked what God wants to do in the hearts of actually humble people? Think about your life for a minute. In fact, close your eyes and begin to think about your own life. Where are the places where you're looking for significance? And that, that might be, I, I want to be known as a significant Christian. I, I want to be known as a person who said the right things during this tumultuous time in human history in America. And I, I want to be known as a person who had the right answers during this election season or during this pandemic that we have been living through. I, I want to be known as a significant, wise, bright, important person. I want to be seen at work for the contribution that I'm making, and it makes me upset when I get overlooked for that promotion again. Where's the place where you can turn your perspective and say, God, help me to become a servant instead of a person looking to be served or noticed? When you see people in trouble, do you cover them with love? Or do you uncover and judge? Where is the place you could begin to look at broken people as a servant? When dealing with a problem, do you enlist the people who are related to Jesus? Or do you point it out and say, see, that is why I don't hang out with those people. Do you try to fix it in your own power? Or do you trust the power of God? As you look at your life, are you a servant of God? I mean, like, do you come in low knowing that God deserves all of your life? Or do you come to him expecting him to serve you as if he died for you so that he could 
just be your servant. In a moment, I do want to pray a blessing over you. I think that there's a blessing to be prayed here. But first, before we pray any of those blessings, I think it would be good if we take a moment and reconcile our relationship with this master whose name is Jesus. I was thinking about him this morning and just the notion of what Jesus did for us that, like it says in scripture, that he could have come like a king. He chose to humble himself and even limit his own power in the world. He chose to come low and humble and then he surrendered his life. He did not get murdered. He gave his life willingly. And I was thinking about how he demonstrated the ultimate power by saying, let death take me, and then I'll show that I can overtake death. And I was thinking about how in the book of Romans it says that if we want to have a relationship with this Jesus, the one true God, the only way to eternal life, the only way to have our sins forgiven, to be purified, and to enter into relationship It makes it real simple in scripture. It says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. It means that that what I just said about Jesus, if if inside your heart you go, I know that is true about who Jesus is, that you would also need to say out loud, I know that is true about who you just said Jesus is. And if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, the Bible makes a promise. It says you will be saved. And then the third thing that you need to do, this one is really simple, but like every day for the rest of your life, just surrender everything to him and be a servant. That's the part you need community for. If you've never made a decision to give your life to Jesus, to, to, to confess that faith that you have in your heart, if you've just been saying, ah, it's just enough to keep it private, it's not enough to keep it private. And if you've never made a public declaration of your faith in Christ, don't go home without it. Don't log off without it. In fact, I'll lead it for you right now. I'll give you the words. And just because we're doing this in community, why don't we all say these words out loud together so that there isn't just like one person saying these words after me by themselves or just a couple of people. Let's all say these words together out loud like it's like we're giving our lives to Jesus all over again. Ready? And then, and then as I say these words, you repeat them. This is, it's so simple. I'll say the words, you repeat them, and, and then we believe that as you pray this prayer, God is going to do something in your life. And if you need him to save your life right now, he's going to do it. Let's pray. Say this. Say, Jesus, I believe believe you are are the Son of God. God. I believe believe you died died and rose again. again. And I believe believe you did that that to save me. me. So I put put my trust 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 in you. you. I I believe that right now, You are my Savior. I submit my life to you as my King. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Hey, look, we believe every single time that we pray that something happens, but we also know when we pray that prayer, something very important. So something very important could be happening. So if you just prayed that prayer, uh, we, don't, we don't do the thing where we like make people come up, and, and especially because you're online, it'd be very hard to make you come up right now. Uh, but, but here's how we do this in this season at Life Church. If you just prayed that prayer and God changed something in your heart, my friend Marcus just stood up and he went to the back and he's standing over there in the courtyard in the sunshine right now, and he is ready to chat with you if you're on campus. We've got folks who are online. In fact, my friend Terry is our brand new YouTube host. Hi, Terry. Uh, if, if you post in the comments right now that you just made a decision to give your life to Jesus, Terry is going to take note of that, and we are going to get a hold of you. We want to celebrate what God is doing on campus and online. We believe that God is changing lives, and let's one more time celebrate how in salvation and in every other way, God is doing a work in and through our lives. Amen? God is good, right? 
Amen. All right. Now, I said I was going to pray a blessing over you, and I would love to do that. And then Pastor Mark is going to come, and he is going to uh, wrap up our time. God, I pray that you would give me the gift and the honor to be able to pray this blessing over my friends who are on campus and online, believing that there is no distance in the Spirit. And so here is what I would have on my heart to pray as a blessing for you. May you, Life Church. May you, our friends who are here on campus and online today, may you have a servant's heart, humble and happy to serve both God and other people. May you have a servant's vision, seeing problems as opportunities to cover others with love and to invite God to respond. May you have serving hands ready for whatever work God directs you to, always trusting in and always obedient to God, even when you don't understand. May you have a servant's mouth, patient to keep quiet in the waiting for God to respond to your prayers and never protesting when you don't get the credit or the recognition. May you be so blessed and may you be a blessing as you serve. In Jesus' name, amen.